Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for today's mission status briefing. Uh, we are here today with the lead station director, Chris Edelin, of uh, this last shuttle mission. And uh, he will begin with a few remarks, and then we'll open the floor for some questions. Chris? Thank you, Amika. Uh, I'm pleased to report another good day of operations on the uh, International Space Station and Space Shuttle Atlantis. The crew made very good progress today on uh, transferring the remaining cargo. Uh, the Atlantis crew uh, spent most of their time in the Raffaello logistics module. Uh, they are now 70% complete with the, uh, with the planned cargo transfer from the MPLM, as well as uh, about 70% complete with their uh, planned mid-deck cargo transfer. Total of 10,000 pounds of cargo is being brought up on Atlantis. And uh, most of the cargo is now on the correct side of the hatches. The things that we were br bringing up to the space station are now uh, on inside the space station, some stowed away, some waiting to be, uh, to be permanently stowed, and the items to be brought back to Earth are now, uh, most of those items are now in the logistics module. Uh, it still looks a little uh, cluttered because a lot of those items have not been placed into their return position yet, fully strapped down. So uh, that's the, the primary remaining task for the crew is to get all the return cargo um, safely stowed. We need it secured uh, for the trip home, so we uh, make sure to maintain the proper center of gravity on the space shuttle for its, uh, for its entry. Um, just to give you uh, a couple specific examples of some of the cargo that we uh, transferred today, um, as far as a couple return items, uh, we're bringing back some old quick dawn masks. These are emergency masks from the space station that are used to provide oxygen in the event of a fire or other emergency. Uh, some expired masks are being brought back. We uh, also uh, brought back uh, the, a, a, a Vazduk bed from the uh, Russian carbon dioxide removal system that was replaced back in February. This is a rather large piece of hardware, so we are bringing that back in the logistics module to save room so the Russians don't have to dispose that in uh, the much smaller Progress supply freighter. For ex examples of some new hardware that came up and was transferred, uh, we transferred the, or the crew transferred the cargo uh, integration, uh, in, uh, cor correction, combustion in integration rack, or SIR. These are fuel bottles that are used to, uh, to uh, study how flames propagate and how fire behaves in zero gravity. That's an important thing to know, not only for uh, spacecraft design and safety, but also just to better understand how fire behaves and to, you know, for uh, plasma physics. So uh, we got that transferred, as well as a new treadmill track for the Tevis treadmill. That's the, uh, the treadmill located down in the service module in the Russian segment. So that's a spare track that will, that will be used in the future when that needs to be changed out. And the crew also transferred a hydrogen dome sensor for the oxygen generation system, or OGS. Uh, this uh, sensor is used as part of the system that takes water uh, recycled water from the space station and using electricity splits the water into hydrogen and oxygen. The crew breathes the oxygen and that's how we uh, primarily how we generate the oxygen on the space station. And then uh, we have a new device on board, a relatively new device uh, called Sabatier that uh, takes the hydrogen from OGS, combines it with the CO2 that we extract from the air with our uh, carbon dioxide removal assembly or CEDRA. It combines those two and puts out water, which can be reused again in the entire process for drinking or oxygen generation. And it also uh, produces methane, which is vented overboard, but someday could be used to produce rocket fuel in future spacecraft. So again, uh, we're bringing up spare parts for our uh, life support system that uh, is a key part of the purpose of the space station, which is to demonstrate advanced life support systems for future space systems. As far as uh, the space station today, our space station crew was doing uh, some science and some uh, routine cleaning. Ron Guerin uh, cleaned out the, uh, some of the ducting in his crewmate uh, Satoshi Furukawa's crew quarter to, uh, just like you would do at home, replacing uh, an air filter and, and cleaning the air filters when they get clogged with dust. Mike Fossum uh, performed an, uh, a spacesuit water loop scrub to clean out the water and iodinate the water in uh, two of the spacesuit cooling loops. And Satoshi Furukawa worked uh, on a science experiment called C-spins, which is a study of how plants grow and regulate their growth in the absence of gravity. In this case, it was uh, cucumber plants. And that's a JAXA experiment uh, conducted uh, on behalf of the Japanese Space Agency. 
and Mike Fossum and Ron Guerin together um, as part of the cargo transfer, uh, uh, part of their duties uh, to support that portion of the mission. They organized the Node 3 or Tranquility end cone. Um, they reorganized all the stowage there and have created a, a lot more of an organized space, which is important because that's where our resistive exercise device, or ARED, is located. That's the, essentially the weightlifting machine that the crew uses to exercise. It's also located near our cupola, where we have our robotics workstation and all the windows that they use when they uh, operate the station robotic arm. So that area has been, uh, been reorganized quite nicely. The Russian crew today spent uh, uh, several hours uh, troubleshooting their treadmill. I mentioned earlier it's called Tevis. It's the, the treadmill down in the Russian segment. Uh, we had believed that a gyro had failed on Tevis, and, uh, and that occurred several months ago. So we brought up a new gyro on STS-135. And we thought that by replacing that, that would uh, restore the, the, the Tevis treadmill to operational use. However, when it was installed, it did not fix the problem. We are seeing the same failure signature, which is that the gyroscope is receiving power but is not spinning up. So that seems to indicate that the problem is upstream of the gyroscope, perhaps uh, in, the, uh, in the controller to that device. So we are looking at rescheduling additional maintenance on Tevis to replace that controller. And that is all I have to report on today's activities. Tomorrow, the crew will be performing more cargo transfer. And also, there will be a joint news conference with the entire crew of Atlantis and the space station at uh, 1324 GMT. And also, um, there will be uh, some work on the spacesuits. Rex uh, Walheim will be resizing the spacesuit that Ron Guerin used on his EVA. He'll be resizing it because that spacesuit is now approaching the end of its useful life and is returning to Earth on Atlantis. This will be Rex's spacesuit to be used in the event of a contingency where he'll have to, where he might have to, to use that suit. He's also going to be resizing a new spacesuit that was brought up on Atlantis. And uh, this suit uh, replaces the one that's coming back and will have a lifetime of anywhere from three to six years and will receive regular maintenance so that we can stretch out that lifetime as long as possible. And that suit will be resized for Ron Guerin uh, in case he has an additional space suit uh, or need to do a spacewalk on the space station. And that's all I had on the uh, timeline summary. So I can open it up for questions. Thank you, Chris. And uh, we have a few people on the phone bridge, but we also have a few folks here. So if you will, folks that are here, if you will, just step up to the mic and state your name and affiliation. Gina? Yeah, Gina Sinceri, ABC News. Could you go back to the device that you talked about and spell the name and go into a little bit more civilian detail for me? I, I didn't try On which one? The device that um, takes hydrogen and puts out, you kind of like whip right through that, and I need a little bit more. OK, you bet. Okay. That device is called Sabatier. It's a uh, S-E-B-A-T-I-E-R. It's named after a French scientist. It's the Sabatier process. Or I guess in Texas, you would pronounce it Sabatier. <laughs> and it, it is part of our regenerative life support system on the station. It takes uh, hydrogen from the oxygen generating system, leftover hydrogen that up to this point has been vented overboard uh, up to uh, several months ago, we've been just venting that hydrogen because it's a, it can be a hazard. But now that Sabatier is operational, we're taking that hydrogen and we're combining it with the, ex, with the waste CO2 from our carbon dioxide removal assembly, or CEDRA. We combine those in, in the Sabatier assembly to produce uh, water, which feeds back into the whole process again, and um, methane. So if you work through the chemical uh, equation, it, it all balances out. And I don't have the, <clears throat> excuse me, I don't have the exact number of months that we've been operating Sabatier. It was um, made operational last year, but uh, we've been using it on and off more and more frequently. So we're very pleased that that, uh, that system's been working. Uh, but again, it's just part of the overall regenerative life support system on station. Dan Vergano with USA Today. You mentioned the uh, Japanese uh, astronaut working on an experiment. I was wondering, could you talk about looking ahead as uh, you're finishing up with the packing and stowing? What's sort of the share of uh, tasks going towards uh, 
stowing and towards tasks and towards things like science experiments just to give us a sense of what's coming up. I don't have the exact breakdown, but I will tell you when this mission was first planned, uh, we had no time set aside for science operations, but it was because of the additional day that we were able to add to the mission as well as the efficiency of the crew that has allowed us to, uh, to begin adding back in science operations. So uh, the experiment that Satoshi Furukawa has been working on is one of the high priority experiments that we wanted to make sure uh, on behalf of JAXA that he was able to complete that. And uh, we are also looking at additional science before the end of the mission. Uh, again, things that, uh, things that are on the top of our research list that we want to get done. Can you give any examples? I don't have the specific experiments. I, I know we're doing more C-spins but uh, the additional experiments, I don't have that with me, but I'll, I'll certainly bring that tomorrow. Philip Sloss with nasaspaceflight.com. Uh, question on the uh, Tevis uh, gyros. Um, was the plan going in uh, to bring the, the, the one that was thought to be bad home, and now, now that you're not sure if, uh, what's the plan basically going forward, or is it still to be determined? It is still to be determined. What you mentioned is, is exactly what is being discussed right now amongst uh, the engineering community and the space station program and, and, and the flight controllers and mission control. Uh, with the, uh, the new gyroscope being installed and it is indicating the same signature as the old one, that would seem to lead one to postulate that perhaps uh, it was not the gyroscope after all. And if so, why would you return uh, the old one? And that is exactly what's being discussed. And uh, there are pros and cons because, of course, if we keep it on station, it takes up stowage space. So that's all being looked at. And uh, we're working up a, uh, an alternate stowage plan if we decide to bring that home so that we can delay the decision as late as possible to give the engineers more time to look at the data. And then just a quick follow. Um how how big is the is the gyro? Is this something that can be brought down on on another uh, vehicle like the Dragon, for instance, in the future? It it will fit through uh, the common berthing mechanism hatch easily. It's uh, it's about this big around. It's pretty it's pretty big, okay. but it'll fit through the hatch. Do you have any idea about uh, mass on that ballpark? Um, I don't. Okay, thank you. Hi, Robert Perlman with CollectSpace.com. I think I heard Sandy Magnus call down about that the MPLM was getting so packed that it was getting to the point where specifying locations didn't really um, didn't really count for anything. Um, it was where things fit. Uh, how important is it that that things go where you had originally prescribed them to go, or can can you now just start packing the last thirty percent in, um, as she said, uh, just where they can fit? Well, we are aiming for a 90% full MPLM return by volume. And um, everything will have to be stowed in its proper place. Um, uh, we can't have anything moving around during entry on the shuttle. We wouldn't want that to interfere with the center of gravity of the shuttle or, or interfere, potentially cause a structural problem. So everything will have to be secured. Um, but we have plenty of flexibility and we have uh, you know, math models and engineering models so that we can uh, uh, adapt in real time to the changing cargo situation and make sure that, that uh, we have correct structural margins for where things are stowed and mounted. If there are nooks and crannies of space found, then uh, you know, as long as we have a way to strap it down, we can generally accommodate that. So the goal is going to be to bring back as much of the stuff from station as we can to, you know, to relieve the stowage issue on station, clear things out, and, uh, you know, and, and leave station in, in as good a shape as possible. Thanks, and um, the crew took part, or was, or will still take part in a well-publicized meal, uh, an all-American meal that was publicized by NASA as being shared here on the ground. Um, I was wondering, did Mission Control take part in the same meal, or um, or some type of ceremonial meal to mark the end of the program? Uh, that did not happen today. Um, the crew did uh, head over to the space shuttle for a joint dinner uh, on the space shuttle side of the hatches this evening. Uh, that, of course, that was a you know, pr private affair for the crew, but um, as far as any you know, joint meals to be shared with the ground, um, I don't have the exact plan for that. I'm not aware of the exact plan. 
denisechowitzbase.com. Um, in one of the interviews this morning, Sandy um, called the view from the cupola. It's as if it's taking a spacewalk without the spacesuit. Um, other than the amazing views of the Earth that you get from the cupola, I was wondering if you could speak about some of the other benefits that you get from having that observatory, especially with robotics operations. Right. Um, you mentioned the robotics. We do have our prime robotics workstation, which is essentially a control panel and a joystick and a translational controller. And those, just like on a video game, they're used to drive the, the huge space station robot arm, the Canada arm. And, uh, and they have, of course, monitors to help them uh, uh, see where the arm is moving and make sure that it doesn't collide with any parts of the space station or any other hardware that it's moving around um, when it's out of view of the windows. But the seven windows on the cupola provide a, a really uh, outstanding view uh, to enhance their situational awareness during the robotics activities. Obviously, it's better to, to look out the window than just to be dependent upon their video monitors. It's also very useful for Earth, observe, uh, Earth photography and Earth observing operations. We send up the crew uh, a message every day with uh, a few features on the ground that we want them to look at if their ground track happens to take them over some interesting features. For example, a volcano that may be erupting or a hurricane or some, or some flooding or drought so that they can take pictures and then they uh, downlink that to the ground and then scientists use that data uh, as part of you know, understanding the Earth's ecosystem. Okay. Any other questions here? Okay, we'll go ahead and go to the phone bridge. Uh, first, we have Charles. Yes, uh, good afternoon. Charles Axton with uh, examiner.com, spaceonstreams.com. Uh, you covered a little bit about this, but I was curious, are there specific prime goals that you're still needing to look at or perform uh, prior to undocking on Tuesday? I could not understand that question. If you could repeat that. Sure. Um, what, can you hear me okay? I can hear you better now. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, John Sykes and Examiner.com, uh, I was looking to see if there were specific prime goals that are still needed to be uh, uh, performed prior to undocking on Tuesday. Okay, your, your question uh, is in regards to are we meeting certain time goals in order to proceed with undocking? Um, yes, we, we have a uh, certain number of hours that we expect is required to complete the MPLM cargo process. The, the number we were going into the mission was about uh, 120 hours to load up the MPLM to 80% full by volume. We are now estimating that with that same 120 crew hours, we'll be able to get to about 90% return on the MPLM. And of course, all the, the, uh, the resupply cargo over to station is, is factored in that as well. So we are, uh, every, every night we get a update from, from Sandy Magnus to report on what items were transferred. And then our, the, the small team here in Houston looks at our list of cargo transfer items and computes uh, how many hours are remaining. So we are about 70% complete with the, uh, with the estimated 120 hours of cargo transfer. So we'll continue to monitor that on a daily basis as we track down towards 100% complete. And we'll make sure that before we have to close up the logistics module and transfer it back to the payload bay of Atlantis that we've completed all of the cargo transfer, but we are actually running ahead of schedule. Great, and uh, of course, this being the final flight for shuttle, could you, and is there talk in, inside the doors of a extension because of the, because you might have that extra day of propellant? Um, even though propellant would, uh, we, we could stay indefinitely docked to the space station uh, because the shuttle is not using any propellant while it's docked. Right now, the space station's uh, control mo moment gyros, the CMGs, are maintaining attitude. So the shuttle is not even using any attitude uh, propellant gas uh, to, to control the, the orientation. So the limiting consumable on Atlantis is uh, cryogenic oxygen and hydrogen, which uh, supplies the fuel cells to keep the lights on and the computers running. So that's a hard constraint. We already committed our, uh, our cryo margin to add the extra day. Uh, so we will be undocking on, uh, on Tuesday, early Tuesday morning, and uh, that is to protect, to make sure that we have enough cryogenic uh, uh, fuel cell consumables to make it to the ground, and we'll, we'll protect actually for two additional days. We call that end of mission plus two capability on our fuel cells. And one 
final one, um, a little off subject, but will you soon give uh, permission for SpaceX uh, for the Dragon docking to station this December? That is scheduled for early December, um, and we are looking forward to that, and that, that is on the, on the books and on the plan. So we're looking forward to having uh, the SpaceX Dragon dock with the International Space Station because that's going to be one of our new commercial cargo providers and, and someday maybe even a, a crew transport vehicle. Okay, so that's on the books for December for docking. Will there be a Dragon flight prior to that, or will that be the next one? The plan is to combine uh, the, the second Dragon flight, which was to be a demo mission, uh, and the third one, which was to be the first docked mission. The plan is going to be to combine those two missions into one, and uh, the, the current date that they're working towards is early December, but that, th that date is, is, uh, is not a hard date. That, that may slip around a little bit because of the fact that they're combining those missions. It might slip into January, but I would expect uh, fairly early, you know, either December or early 2012, we'll see that mission fly. Great. Thanks, Chris. You're welcome, Charlie. Okay. Up next on the phone bridge, we have Marsha Dunn. Marsha? Yes. Hi. I um, hate to pester you about the all-American meal, but could it be that the lunch uh, ended up being the all-American meal? Do you know? Well, I will admit, I think you guys know more about the all-American meal than I do. So, no, I don't have the, the answer for you, but I'll, I'll certainly work with Amico to find out the answer. Be great because there were several news releases put out, you know, in the last couple of days regarding the big meal, and I just wanted to try to ascertain when the astronauts might be doing that. Yeah, Marshall, you bet. We'll, we'll work it with you on that. Did great. you have any, any other questions? It's all for me. Thank you. Okay. Next on the phone bridge, we have Irene Klotz. Irene? Hi. Thanks very much. Um, I just had a, two questions. The first, um, on the SpaceX docking, when did NASA... Um, decide to go ahead and give SpaceX permission to do the docking? Uh, I don't have the exact date on that decision, but that's the working plan right now. So if you're asking if it's uh, been formally, formally released, uh, I, I would have to go back and check on that. That's the working plan. Okay. Um, and the other question I had is, uh, I think you mentioned that the crew transfers were about, um, the cargo transfers were about 70% complete, is that ahead of um, where the schedule um, expected was expected by this time? Yes, we are about 12 hours ahead of where we expected to be at the end of this day. Yeah. Is that all your questions, Irene? Yes, thanks. You're welcome. Uh, Bill? Uh, yeah, hi, Bill Harwood. Could you, Chris, could you just, what is the signature on the TVIS? I mean, what is it not doing that, you know, it wasn't doing before? Uh, the, the, again, the, the gyroscope obviously has to spin, you know, quickly. Uh, I, don't, I'm not, I don't have the exact number of RPMs that it typically spins at, but the purpose of the, the gyro is to spin rapidly and to provide gyroscopic stability for the treadmill. If you've ever seen video of the crew members running on the treadmill, you know, obviously there's a lot of force when you, uh, you know, press your feet into the treadmill when you're running. So the gyroscope helps to stabilize it so that it doesn't move and bang into structure. And also, to, uh, by stabilizing it, it, it minimizes the number of vibrations that are introduced into the structure of the space station that could interfere with uh, experiments. So the signature that we've been seeing is that the gyroscope receives power but, doesn't, but does not spin up. So the things we've, well, been, look so the things we've been looking at are it's, it, it's either a failure in the gyroscope uh, or perhaps the cable, and we did replace the cable today as well, and we exonerated the cable, or at least uh, it, it would not seem to indicate that the cable's the problem. Or it could be the, uh, the VIS controller, the vibration isolation system controller. That's the next leg in the, uh, the fault tree that we're going to go uh, investigate, and we'll be swapping that out on a future date that we're still working. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you, Chris. Uh, with that, this uh, concludes today's briefing, and uh, the station and the uh, shuttle crew have both gone to bed at 3 and 3.30, respectively. Up next on NASA TV, if you haven't seen it already, the um, Solid Rocket Booster camera views video of Atlantis's Solid Rocket Boosters um, will replay at 4.30 uh, this afternoon or immediately following this briefing, and then we have the Flight Day 7 highlights that will begin at 5 p.m. Central Time, and those will be uh, aired at the top of every hour, um, every every hour um, throughout the crew sleep, and then we have ISS flight director update with Courtney McMillan tonight at 11:45 p.m. 
Uh, once again, thank you, Chris, and I'd like to thank everyone here for joining us uh, back to Mission Control Houston. Hi, I'm James Keaton. I'm Roger Gomez. I'm Jonathan Hawthorne Sr. I'm Dan Jackson. I'm Tony Reynos. I'm George Salazar. I'm Andrew Lee. We are the communications and tracking officers on the final shuttle mission. And you're watching NASA TV.